make way before the king of Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Worship Online with Bear Valley Community Church. We are so glad that you've joined us this morning. I want to let you know about a couple things as our service gets started. First of all, normally if you were here with us on a Sunday morning, we would ask you to fill out one of these communication cards. But you can't exactly do that right now. I'm guessing you don't have a bunch of these laying around your house. So what we're asking everyone to do instead is to go to bearvalleychurch.com connect uh, you can find that link in the video description and fill out a communication card there. We want to be sure we're staying in touch with everyone who's part of our church or if you're part of our community as well. We would love to hear from you this week just to know how you're doing, know if there's any way that we can be praying for you or if there's something we can help you out with or a way that you want to get connected to our church. So again, go ahead and open up a new tab or a new window right now. Take a minute and go to bearvalleychurch.com connect and fill out a communication card. We would love to hear from you. The other thing we want to let you know about is that while we would love to be together on a Sunday morning like this, we have a unique opportunity to reach our community, to reach people wherever they are right now. So if you would, we would love for you to take just a second to share this video, whether you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube, share it with your family and your friends so that they can get connected while this service is happening too. Also, if you're watching on Facebook, you can start a watch party where your friends can join in and you can watch the video online together. Thanks for helping us reach our community, even though we're not able to be together in our building on this Sunday morning. That's all we've got for right now. Let's watch this together.
we're in a series called The Search for the Real Jesus. And we're studying through the Sermon on the Mount and we've come to the place in the Sermon on the Mount where it's the most famous prayer in the world, the Lord's Prayer. That's what we're going to be looking at today. Now, <clears throat> Jesus didn't give us this prayer so that we could just say it over and over repetitiously. He gave it to us as a model. And so sometimes it's called the model prayer. It's a model for how we could pray. Because the disciples came up to him. Actually, this is not in the Matthew passage, but in the Luke uh, uh, paraphrase or, or parallel. In the Luke parallel, it says that the disciples came up to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. It's not recorded in the New Testament that they ever asked, uh, teach us to share the gospel, teach us to witness, teach us to teach the Bible, teach us to, about how to preach. But they did say, teach us to pray, because they realized how important it was. And so today we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer. Now, <clears throat> this is the owner's manual for my car. And if I want to know how my car works, then I can use this. But if I want to know how life works, I use this, because this tells me about, how, about who I am and how to live and how to live with God. Now, in this prayer, we realize right away that God, our creator, the one who wrote the owner's manual, knows us and he knows what we need and he knows how we need to pray. And he knows how each part of this prayer connects with who we are on the inside. So we're going to be looking as we look through this prayer about how it affects our lives and what it reminds us of. Remember, God is the one who initiates prayer and he invites us into his presence. And so we get a chance to pray. What we're going to do is we're just going to look at each phrase in the Lord's Prayer. So let's just start. Number one, I pray our Father which art in heaven and it reminds me that I am loved. It reminds me that I have a relationship with the Father. It reminds me that I am God's son. Now, how awesome is it that God's my father? But some people have a struggle with father. I mean, what, what was your father like? Did you have the greatest father ever who's loving and always compassionate and caring? Or did you have a father that, you know, sometimes he's happy, sometimes he's uh, miserable, sometimes he's violent, sometimes he's angry? Um, well, we have a God who is not like that. He's always loving. He's always compassionate. He never has a bad day. He never gets moody. And so even if your father wasn't the greatest, you can, from the good qualities of your father, you can apply that to God as your father. From the bad qualities of your father, you can know that God is the opposite. You can learn from either the positive or the negative. In John 1, 12 and 13, it says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not of natural descent or of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. In the Old Testament, the concept of God as a father was not really a dominant theme. But in the fullness of time, when Jesus came into this world, he came to reveal to us that we are in a personal relationship with God. And that relationship is like a father to a son, a father to a daughter. When Jesus revealed to us who God is, he didn't, he, he not only told us about God's character, but he also told us about how we're related to God. And that is that God is our loving father. In Matthew 7, 1, it says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him. He cares for you and he's never too busy. He's always the good father. That's the first phrase, our father which art in heaven. Let's look at the second. The second one is, I pray hallowed be thy name and it reminds me of my need to worship. Hallowed, it just means holy or to be revered or to be honored, to be praised. Now, what about praise? It, it's always seemed kind of confusing to me about God wanting to be praised. Is, is God like, uh, hey, everybody, praise me. You know, I want to be praised. Uh, that doesn't sound very humble, does it? And yet, uh, C.S. Lewis said something about praise that uh, really helped me understand the whole situation. He wrote, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is the appointed consummation. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete until it is expressed. 
And so when we praise God, it's partially for us because we have to praise if we really love him. In the Westminster a Shorter Catechism, question number one is the beginning point of life. And it says this, what is the chief end of man? What is the chief end of people on this earth, of human beings on this earth? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It is when we glorify God, it is when we honor God, it is when we serve God that, that, that where the joy comes from. And, and that's like a summary of all of life. We serve God, we honor God, and he gives us the joy. You know, we, we do this all the time. We praise anything that's great, whether it's at a football game or whether it's a beautiful sunset or whether we're so in love with God that we just have to say, God, thank you. I love you. You're the greatest. There was this passage in Matthew 14 where, G, where Peter walked on the water. Remember that whole story? And then he kind of began to sink and Jesus picked him back up. But I want you to notice what happens at the end of this story. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down and those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. They had to worship him. They had to like, who does this? And that's how we worship God. Who does this? We're just so thankful and so grateful for being able to live with a God like that. Well, let's move to the next one. Number three, I pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it reminds me of God's purpose for my life. This is what we've been praying for, that God's love, which is perfectly experienced in heaven, could also be experienced here on earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That what's happening in heaven could also happen on earth. In Ephesians 1.10, Paul wrote this, this plan which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth, with Christ as the head. His kingdom has started. And in every place, every person who sets up Jesus Christ as the Lord of their, in their lives, in that place, in that person, God's kingdom has been established. And if you're alive, God has a purpose for your life. Now we divide the world wrongly, I think, into the sacred and the secular. But guess what? With God, there is no secular work. Everything is sacred for those who believe in him. Remember when um, Jesus was baptized, the very beginning of his ministry. And a voice came from heaven, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, what had been Jesus' job up until that point? He had been a carpenter, a builder. And for the last 20 years or so, 20 years he had been a carpenter and God said this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased and God says this is my beloved teacher in whom I'm well pleased this is my beloved medical professional in whom I'm well pleased this is my beloved football player in whom I'm well pleased nothing is is uh, secular in the life of those who serve the Lord all is sacred. In Matthew 6, just a few verses past where we are right here in the Lord's Prayer. Instead, be concerned above everything else with the kingdom of God and with what he requires of you, and he will provide you with all these things. Live out his kingdom. Make him be the cause of your life, because this is the great cause of life, is to live for him. This is your ultimate purpose, and then you have many other purposes within this great cause. Let's look at number four. I pray, give us this day our daily bread, and it reminds me that God will always take care of me. The first thing I want to point out is, it says daily bread. Not weekly, not monthly. Like the manna. Remember the manna in the Old Testament? God provided for the children of Israel while they were wandering in the desert. And he gave them just enough for every day. And so every morning they went out and they picked up the manna, and that was food for the day. But after 24 hours... 
It rotted. And so God showed them how to live one day at a time. Give us this day our daily bread. I think he's referring back to the manna here is that God still does that. He gives us enough for one day at a time. And uh, again, in Matthew 6, uh, on past where we are here, in verse 31 through 33, it says, Don't worry about all these things, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and He will give you everything that you need. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. How about that? Because they have no heavenly father. But yet for you and me, they don't have to dominate our thoughts because God will provide for us our daily bread, our daily needs. Now we're kind of in a weird time right now with uh, the coronavirus and um, having to uh, shelter in place and all that. And there's a lot of worries about our economy, about our health, about getting food to eat, everything. And this is my favorite passage when, at times when I'm worried. It's uh, what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. And His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. These are worried times that we're going through, but I hope you can make this verse a part of your life because instead of worrying, if you'll pray about everything, then it says God will provide supernatural peace to guard your heart and He will protect your mind and your thought life and your worry and He will be your strength. Well, number five. I pray and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it reminds me of my need to forgive. Now, in the King James, we're using the King James here as the traditional version of the Lord's Prayer. But actually in the King James, it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our, our debtors. But the word debts, you know, sounds like money back then. Really, it just means sin. Back then it meant sin. And so later on, um, in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, that's the version that we're using here, it uses the word trespasses. The Anglican Book of Common Prayer was first written in 1549, and then it was uh, continually revised as things went along. But forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Um, forgive us our sins means God doesn't want guilt hanging over us. In Colossians 2, when you were spiritually dead because of your sins and because you were not free from the power of your sinful self, God made you alive with Christ and he forgave all our sins. He canceled the debt, which listed all the rules that we'd failed to follow. He took away that record with its rules and nailed it to the, to the cross. So if you're a believer, all of your sins have already been forgiven. In fact, technically they were forgiven 2000 years ago on the cross, when Jesus died on the cross, He died for you at that moment and forgave you of all your sins. And so each day we can ask forgiveness to restore our relationship with God. Technically, we don't ask forgiveness that God would forgive us of our sins because they were forgiven 2,000 years ago. We're restoring our relationship with God, just like I do with my wife and those close to me. I have to restore that relationship from time to time because I'm not perfect and I goof up all the time. And so God does not want that guilt hanging over us. And he gives us the beautiful gift of forgiveness. But he also doesn't want our unforgiveness to hang over us. He doesn't want resentment to hang over us. There's a, the famous quote, holding a grudge is like drinking rat poisoning and hoping that the rat will die. When we hold on to a grudge, it just ruins us. And so we too must forgive. In Colossians 3.13, Paul wrote, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you. And so you must forgive others. He doesn't want guilt hanging over us. He doesn't want unforgiveness hanging over us as well. Well, let's look at number six, the last one here. 
I pray and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And it reminds me that God always protects me. Now, lead us not into temptation. Does that mean that God tempts us? Well, absolutely not. In fact, the scripture is very clear about that. In James 1, James said this, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But let each person, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. So he's saying, keep us from temptation and keep us from evil. Now, Paul wrote this statement in in Ephesians 6 about the armor that God gives us. He says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power and put on all the arm of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. And he goes on and lists the different armor. And here he talks about the armor of the helmet of salvation. Now, why does he use this analogy? Why does he say that salvation is like a helmet that protects us? It's because temptation is in the mind. It's a battle for the mind. And all those who believe in Jesus Christ, all those who have given their, their lives to the Lord, all those who have been born again, have the helmet of salvation to protect your mind, to help you in the battle for the mind. Now, the Lord's Prayer. I mentioned it's a model. Well, I read about how Martin Luther um, used the model prayer in his own prayer life. Actually, I have a Martin Luther bobblehead doll that um, my staff gave me because they know that I love Martin Luther so much. So each day we, uh, we tap him on the head. Well, anyway, here was Martin Luther's concept of how to use the Lord's Prayer. He said when he prayed, he did three things. Number one, he would start by reading the scripture. In other words, what's God saying to me right now? And you can just read anywhere and you can find things that God is speaking to you about. Number two, he would take the Lord's Prayer and he would pray each phrase of it as an outline. And so he would um, talk about in, in his own prayer life, he would say, our Father who art in heaven. And then he would talk about how much God loves him and, and how much he loves God. And then he would move on to worship and he would worship God. And then he would talk about the kingdom and how is his purpose tuned into God. So he would use the outline of the Lord's Prayer to just kind of walk through phrase by phrase each part of the Lord's Prayer. And he said that would keep him on track because he had a problem. Maybe you have this problem too. Does your mind ever wander when you pray? Well, Martin Luther's did and so does mine and so does everybody else's. And so he used the outline as a way to keep his mind from wandering, keep it on track and just to walk through each part of the Lord's Prayer. And then number three, he just said, then I just pray about everything else that's on my heart. Read the Bible first, use the Lord's Prayer as an outline, and then whatever else is on your heart, just take that to the Lord. Now, this Lord's Prayer, it's a model for our lives. It's a model to remind us who we are. It's a model to let us know about our relationship with God. It's a model to remind us that God initiates prayer and he invites us into the conversation. So right now, let's just pray the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray it together. Wherever you are, let's pray it together out loud right now. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, everybody. Thank you again for joining us on this Sunday morning. We hope you had a great experience worshiping and learning with us today. I want to let you know about a couple things before we go. First of all, if you haven't gotten a chance to fill out your online communication card, take a second right now, go to bearvalleychurch.com slash connect and fill one out. Let us know how we can be praying for you this week or if there's a way that you want to get connected to our church. We'll look forward to hearing from you. Also, if you'd like to give an offering today, we offer online giving at bearvalleychurch.com slash give. You can give one time or you can set up recurring giving. 
You can also mail a check to our church at the address that's going to appear on the screen, or you can, you know, just look us up on Google and find our address there. Thank you for continuing to support our, the ministry of our church, even though we're not able to be together right now. We'll look forward to getting to be together again soon. And that's all we've got for this morning. We've got one more song that we're going to sing together. Here it is. Shame is undone. 